Hey guys, Crypto Dad here again. Thanks for joining me on the Saturday Night live stream, live from Michigan, where you can throw out questions and I'll do my best to get them answered. We'll talk about Bitcoin. We'll talk about the news. I'm going to talk about some altcoins and some security issues. I'm going to move some crypto around for you guys so you can see what's happening. And as always, I'm going to do my best to get to your questions and see if we can't solve your problems right here live. So let's get started. Ah. <laughs> Okay, I think we had that same issue last week. Um, generally, uh, the reason I turned that intro off on that side shot is I think I was showing you guys the cat laying on the keyboard last week. I think that's why I did that. Um, but anyway, here we are. I'm here uh, with the rig again. Um, I'm kind of disappointed. I have to tell you, uh, I, uh, I keep wanting to upgrade my rig, but there's not much out there that's better than what I've got. So it's a little bit depressing. <laughs> there are some, uh, I think AMD and uh, Intel are both coming out with new uh, chips this year, uh, but not uh, for, uh, I think I can get a better Threadripper than I have, but uh, the upgraded Threadripper is like super, super expensive. Just the chip is like, I don't know, like 10 grand. It's like ridiculous. Uh, so the upgraded chips are more for um, gaming rigs, and this is like a creator rig. So anyway, uh, I'm kind of like in that that desert, you know, where I want to upgrade, and I, there's not much to do. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here again. Uh, if you know or don't care, <laughs> OBS Studio has uh, upgraded. There's been an update to OBS Studio. So I'm hoping that our disconnect, reconnect issues are a thing of the past. Uh, it seems like it's been doing pretty well for the last uh, few weeks. So uh, that's good news. So let's jump into the market. Uh, we've got uh, a kind of a rally on our hands here. Uh, and the real question is, is this like uh, a up from the depths rally uh, to new highs? Or is this just like a little short squeeze? Um, we'll find out, right? So let's see, where are we at here? Yeah, OBS Studio, the upgrade is, uh, uh, the interface has been upgraded. It's pretty cool. So, uh, but anyway, let's go over here uh, and greet everyone that's here. Thank you guys for being here. I'm not going to insert any commercials if I can help it. Uh, let's see here. Kenneth Wiedner was here early. JDO was here early. Uh, just have fun was here early talking about an ADA withdrawal from uphold. Uh, we'll play around. We're going to do some withdrawals tonight. So, uh, 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 withdrawals can be, um, painstaking, uh, and terrifying, right? Uh, especially if you're doing a big chunk of crypto before I get too far into this guys, please. When you withdraw crypto from an exchange to your wallet, if it's the first time you have ever done it, please, 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 please do a small test transaction first to make sure that you've got it on both ends, right? Do not go on to an exchange and withdraw your life savings to a wallet that you've never withdrawn to before, right? You're, it's just a, a recipe for heartache. Right. So let's get that out of the way. Uh, so anyway, uh, Mr. Miski, hello. Uh, Mustafa Lamb is here again. Hello. You always throw those icons up uh, in uh, the comments and in my uh, uh, YouTube comments as well. So uh, I hope that's a good thing. The guy, I don't know what this is, the, the, the guy with the arms sideways and the, the hearts with the red cross. Uh, that must be something good, I hope. <laughs> Brandon is here, 300 HSV. Good morning from Australia. Uh, it's uh, 6 p.m. here in Michigan. Uh, interestingly, I mean, a lot of people may not realize this, but I'm about as far west as you can get and still on uh, Eastern Standard Time. 
right? Uh, I'm on New York time, even though I'm practically in Chicago. <laughs> I'm just across the lake over there, right? Uh, but good morning from Australia. Frank Rodriguez, thanks for being here again. Mr. David is here again listening. Thank you. It's always nice to have Mr. David here. Uh, Kojo Kinglow. Kinney Glow. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Amsterdam Hollam, Joanne L. Uh, DR, happy Saturday. Happy Saturday back to you. Uh, Jim C., Kenneth Wiedner. Brandon, DDR5 RAM would be a good upgrade. Yes, that is one thing that this uh, rig does not support, and it's uh, DDR5 and uh, P PCI5. So I'm considering just going out and doing a new rig uh, just to, for those two, right? Uh, well, it's, it'll be fun, right? Yeah, uh, Dan, uh, before we get too much further, uh, let's take a look. And Dan, thank you for being here, as always. Let's take a look at Crypto.com. And we did just break 21.8. Uh, according to Crypto.com, uh, well, there we go, 21.9. Uh, looks like this uh, weekend rally is getting some legs. Uh, keeping in mind that weekend rallies are usually... Uh, low volume, right? Uh, when we really, what we really want to see are sustained rallies during the week, uh, during the business day, right? When big people are in there trading. Uh, these weekend rallies can be fun and exciting, but they're typically low volume, but I'll take it, right? Uh, the uh, Bitcoin price is brought to you by Crypto.com, one of my partners, Crypto.com, where you can buy, sell, uh, deposit, withdraw, stake cryptocurrencies. And they have that uh, uh, metal Visa card where you can sell your crypto uh, right in the app and spend it in the real world in real time Uh on using your uh, metal visa card anywhere visa is accepted you can also run down to the atm and withdraw cash how's that for a uh, quick liquidation so uh been a partner with uh, crypto.com for a long time uh let's see let's jump into uh the topics for tonight if you look down in your description, I've got some topics I want to cover tonight, So, uh, and I've got several news stories I want to cover, so I'll try to be uh, as uh, succinct as possible so we don't uh, run out of time and spend too much time on the news. We've got a lot of fun stuff to do tonight. Uh, and then down below there are some coins I bought recently. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of buying lately, but uh, these are coins that are kind of always on my radar. Uh, we've got the Ledger backup pack still, uh, and I'm going to demo a little bit about how uh, a mirror backup Ledger device works, just so you can kind of wrap your head around it a little bit, uh, and the rest of my uh, affiliate links down there. If you're interested in any of these services, uh, I encourage you to use my affiliate link. Uh, it benefits me and the channel, so I would appreciate it. And we'll go down here a little more, and here's all our news stories that we're going to cover tonight. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first big story is the uh, rally in Bitcoin. Uh, I noticed yesterday a few points uh, that Bitcoin was up uh, about 10%, which is pretty good, pretty darn good for Bitcoin in one within a 24-hour period. So if you notice now, it's only up 1.61 from 24 hours ago, right? Because 24 hours ago was yesterday at 6, and Bitcoin was rallying yesterday at 6, right? So uh, it was up like 10% from uh, Thursday at 6, right? So here we go. Traders appear to be shrugging off interest rate fears as they wait for more inflation data next week. Uh, it's one of those weird uh, phenomenon where uh, all of the uh, macro data uh, on the surface appeared to be not great, right? We had announcements that uh, the, the Fed would be continuing to raise rates. The uh, European Central Bank was going to continue to raise rates, or they announced that they were raising their rates 0.5 basis point, 0.75 basis points. So uh, we really had no relief 
we really had nobody, uh, you know, the Fed has not decided to start lowering rates or anything crazy or even hinting that they're going to do it. Everything was bad news for uh, risk assets, basically. Uh, and But we had this crazy rally, so go figure. I believe the stock market kind of mirrored it, too, yesterday. Um, so we'll see, right? Uh, let's see, Friday's push ahead appears to be tied to signals that the U.S. central bank will reverse course from monetary tightening to monetary easing in 2023. Oh, of course, right? We all kind of knew that at some point they're going to have to lower rates, right? They cannot keep raising rates. This whole house of cards will fall if they keep doing that. Uh, but they, they seem to be intent on doing it, and they don't care if they destroy the economy in the meantime. But now... For some reason, there's people are predicting that they will start lowering in 2023, apparently. But they've been predicting that pretty much all year, that at some point in 2023, they would start to lower rates. So go figure. Uh, Bitcoin rose 9%. And on Crypto.com, it was I noticed it was 10% a few points during the day. Right. So I don't know what they're basing this on. They're probably basing it on a, cl a quote unquote closing price, even though Bitcoin never stops trading. It's 24 uh, seven. OK, and then the, let's take a look at this. Uh, after big rally past 21K, Bitcoin's price momentum may not last. Uh, this is uh, I guess this is an opinion <laughs> of someone uh, Bitcoin's price gain was the biggest in six months, leading broad market rally in cryptocurrencies that pushed the industry's market capitalization back over one trillion. Uh, it's that that's a, a nice sounding little sub headline, but uh, the reality is is that Bitcoin uh, is only coming up off of twenty thousand, right? It's not. I mean, it was a big jump percentage wise, but we're still down in the 20,000 range, right? And, uh, you know, off 30,000, which was several months back, and then off, you know, 50,000, which was kind of the beginning of the year. So we're really price, uh, you know, in the long term of this full year, we're still off year to date, way off. So, yeah, we had a nice little bump, but, you know, to me, it's really nothing to write home about. But it's encouraging, right? And a lot of people jump into the live stream when we have these little pops. So, great. Uh, let's see. The sudden burst in the market for BTC might lose momentum quickly, crypto analysts said. Uh, let's see. If buyers continue with the same sentiment, we might see 22.4 or 23, which would be cool. Um we're well over our one trillion mark for the entire crypto sector. Uh, now I'm kind of curious what caused all of this. I think there's uh, some pump pump uh, on social media, Telegram, uh, Twitter. I don't know, but uh, we're going to talk about another story where there's like this crazy run up, which makes no sense to me, uh, being a crypto enthusiast. Uh, we'll talk about the Terra Luna thing in a, f a few stories. Uh, investors might sell it off at any moment. Uh, Bitcoin is up 7.1 over the past, uh, was up 7.1 in the past month, but still fell by 10% uh, percent over the last 30 days. Uh, we, we got a lot of high volatility. So we've got, uh, it is summer still, I guess. There might be some people still out there on their vacations, and that's typically kind of a low-volume time of year. For the stock market, right, uh, Bitcoin has its own trajectory. But, and so here at the end, we don't expect a long-lasting trend shift at the moment and look forward to further accumulation around and below 20K uh, region for BTC. Uh, this is Joe uh, De Pasquale. Uh, crypto uh, CEO of crypto hedge fund manager Bitbull Capital, right? That's his opinion. All right, so uh, that's kind of my opinion too. I don't see this as a sustained rally. I'm kind of waiting for the next shoe to drop, 
and uh, kind of still on the sidelines uh, about making any uh, big uh, purchasing decisions myself. That's just my opinion, right? Uh, okay, uh, so we've got the Ethereum merge coming up in less than a week, right? In five days, uh, that is the target for the merge. And they it uh, looks like it's going to go off uh, as planned, right? Ethereum ready for the merge at last. Shadow Fork completes successfully. Uh, the successful completion of the last known Shadow Fork signals the readiness of the Ethereum network for migrating to proof-of-stake consensus mechanism. Uh, Ethereum developers confirm the successful completion of the prerequisites, i.e. shadow forks required for the highly anticipated blockchain upgrade, the merge. Uh, shadow forks help developers stress test synchronization assumptions to ensure network safety during permanent upgrades. Uh, in light of the merge, Ethereum developers implemented the first shadow fork back in April, uh, and now nearly six months in, they've just confirmed uh, mainnet Shadow Fork 13. The last Shadow Fork uh, was successful, signaling the readiness of the network for migrating to a proof-of-stake POS consensus mechanism. Um, as far as, and I've, I've kind of tried to look in it, it's, it's always kind of a mystery uh, but as far as uh, your Ethereum in your wallets, I, it's going to be fine. Uh, I think some people are concerned maybe about some of the uh, ERC-20 ecosystems and uh, staking uh, platforms, right? They're, not, they're a little worried about maybe uh, some, some smart contracts, right? If you've got some uh, liquidity pools parked in smart contracts, uh, what's going to happen during the merge. And uh, I'm sure uh, they'll be fine. Uh, otherwise, you know, the Ethereum developers wouldn't be doing this, right? If it was going to break the entire ecosystem, they probably wouldn't be doing this, right? They've probably uh, tested all of that, right? But because of that fear, uh, maybe, you know, double assets or whatever uh, on these uh, smart contracts. A lot of uh, money has been pulled out of DeFi uh, in anticipation of the merge. Uh, so uh, there might be a, a nice little pop after the merge of people that decide to get back into DeFi, right? Uh, we also might see a uh, sell the news dip in Ethereum, Although we have seen quite a dip from the uh, Ethereum highs, right? Right now, we're looking at Ethereum at uh, 17, almost 1780, almost 1800. But we were up uh, almost to 2000 uh, a couple weeks back. So uh, it did sort of pull back from its pre merge excitement, right? But this might be the second wave of the premier merge excitement, and we might see uh, a sell the news dip on Ethereum after the merge actually occurs, right? This is a pretty common phenomenon in markets. Uh, when there's some good news, there's a lot of anticipation, there's a lot of people buying, and then the day that, that the news hits, breaks, then we see a pullback, right? So we see a lot of buying in anticipation, and then uh, it it dips when the news actually hits. Let's say buy the dip, buy sell buy the news. <laughs> now I can't even say it. Uh, buy buy the rumor, sell the news. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So uh, the Ethereum is uh, on track for the the fork. Now, uh, one uh, story that I did not uh, put in here, which I probably should have. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Is that it? ESG uh, news? Uh, there was a uh, White House, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know if I get the White House. Let's try that. Ah, yeah, here it is. 
Uh, White House is mulling a ban on Bitcoin. Now, that's pretty extreme. They haven't said that at all. Uh, so that's a FUD article right there. But there is no, the White House is not planning to print ban proof of work mining. Uh, but there are some stories. Uh, now, notice this is Barron's, right? A, a respectable uh, news organization, right? Been around for a long time. Uh, they're claiming that uh, there was a statement released uh, in regards to uh, the uh, ESG, which is, you know, uh, whatever they, whatever that stands for. <laughs> oh, my gosh. ESG, right, is uh, sustainability, right? Uh, I'm not sure what it's called. ESG and sustainability, uh, whatever. Oh, here it is. What does it mean, right? Oh, environmental, social, and governance. Okay. Uh, ESG concerns over proof of work uh, are that, and, and the statement said something like, well, if, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to look at the effects on the environment of uh, cryptocurrency mining, and uh, if it can't uh, fi figure it out uh, how to lower itself, we might have to regulate it. I mean, it was very nebulous statement, right? It was not a direct statement like this, that, oh, we're going to ban Bitcoin mining forever, right? That's, that's not what was said. There was just some general talk about it. Uh, but these fears have uh, come out a little more um, because of the Ethereum merge, right? We had the, the two largest cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, at this point are both proof of work, which is uh, a way of validating the network and creating new uh, coins on the network. Uh, it involves solving mathematical problems, usually with mining rigs, because you need a lot of processing power. And according to the powers that be, this is not green, right? Uh, funny how they don't evaluate the banking system and its contribution to global warming because all those shiny new bank buildings that you see everywhere uh, that are using uh, electricity, uh, I mean, every you just get in your car and drive down any major street. How many banks are you going to pass? Do they really need that many bank branches, right? Is that green? <laughs> <laughs> but no one's talking about, oh, gee, the banks might be, you know, contributing to global warnings, warming, so we might have to regulate them out of existence, right? It's not going to happen, right? And even if the government tries to regulate Bitcoin out of existence, they will most likely fail, right? Anyway, it's a decentralized system. It can't be like, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to bring this up because it is kind of a story uh, that's related to the merge, right? Uh, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. But we are we are going to see a lot of FUD surrounding that because now that Ethereum is no longer proof of work, Bitcoin is, you know, the elephant in the room now as far as proof of work mining, right? Still a proof of work. And the, a lot of people will tell you that proof of work is the best system for maintaining a uh, vibrant and secure blockchain, right? Uh, proof of stake is great, but it does tend to become centralized. So it's, that's, it suffers from that uh, fault. It suffers <laughs> from that. We don't like centralization, right? So anyway, uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Let's talk about Terra Luna. Uh, and this crazy stuff going on in the Terra ecosystem. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, Terra crashed horribly earlier this year. Uh, it was uh, had it was an ecosystem that uh, was uh, had a stablecoin called UST that was an algorithmic stablecoin, and uh, it was the darling of the crypto world. Uh, people were earning 20% on their UST deposits and uh, making a lot of money on their Terra Luna tokens. Uh, but the stablecoin lost its peg 
And uh, once that happened, it quickly uh, fell apart. And uh, once UST started falling, Luna started falling, and the whole thing just crashed horribly, right? Lost 99.9% .9 of its value. Uh, and for some weird, and then they came out with this new Luna shortly thereafter, which also flopped, right? And now all of a sudden, everybody wants to know about Luna Classic, right? Luna Classic had this huge run up uh, last week for no, well, the, the only thing that uh, they announced was some new burn mechanism. Uh, and it's, tempting for people to speculate in a coin like this because it's way less than a penny. So you can get a lot of it, right? You can put in a hundred or a thousand dollars and maybe hopefully double your money if it goes up 50% or a hundred percent or whatever. And so I don't know, people were asking me in the live stream, uh, have been asking me about it for the last three weeks. They're like, well, wh what about Terra? What about Terra classic? And I'm like, why in God's name, would you want a coin that has is a spectacular failure, has no use case, right? Uh, you know, all kinds of fraud allegations. But I don't know. People want to buy it again all of a sudden. So uh, Terra Classic rallied last week like 200%. And now uh, over the last couple of days, we've got uh, New Luna has also been rallying. Uh, for no apparent reason, right? Speculative frenzy. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at this story a little bit. Luna, the cryptocurrency of the Terra blockchain, recreated ver uh, version after uh, dramatically imploding earlier this year, tripled in price in a few hours' time Friday, trading clo close to its all-time high set in early June when the token was announced. The token's price skyrocketed to almost $7 from less than $2, according to data by cryptocurrency pricing tracker CoinGecko. At press time, Luna was changing hands around $6, up more than 212% in the last 24 hours. Uh, Luna's a native token of the second version of the Terra blockchain, brought back to life after Terra's collapse in May, which wiped out $60 billion in value. The implosion led to investigations. For, I told you all this, right? Uh, <laughs> I just don't understand why anybody would want to buy this coin. Just makes no sense to me. Uh, so, but all risky assets appear to be rallying broadly. I think there's a lot of chatter on Discord and Telegram, and I would tend to say it's mostly scammers. Uh, here we go. Crypto market watchers are puzzled by Luna's wild price movement as there hasn't been, as there hasn't been any news of development specific to the network that would ignite hype and retail traders. I'm thinking this is another, you know, all these Robin Hood uh, short uh, all these Robin Hooders that are out there buying shorted stocks. Uh, like Bed Bath and Beyond and GameStop, I think it's similar to that. You know, we got all just a bunch of people that are that are jumping in at the same time to try to, uh, you know, push up an asset that is basically worthless. Right? I just don't get it. That's just me. I guess I'm too old. Don't know what to tell you guys. Uh, so that's that. Uh, where is my, oh, did I even pop out chat yet? I guess I haven't popped out chat. Look at me. Can you believe it? Let's pop it out. Uh, just make a quick, uh, just to make a quick buck on Loon, Luna Classic, right? Yeah, I mean, this is not an investment. This is pure speculation, as far as I'm concerned. They're, it's like they, uh, you know, the it was a great idea. It failed spectacularly. Um and now there's people just like uh, trading the pieces of it that are just laying around, right? People who bought heavy into Luna after the crash are rich now, Rex. LOL. It was a great opportunity back then. It was at zero. LOL. Yeah, I get it. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> All these people that are buying this worthless asset are rich and I'm not. So uh, too bad for me. 
I still don't believe in Luna, <laughs> even if there are people out there getting rich on it. Well, what can I say? Uh, not, not something that I want in my portfolio, but hey, more power to you guys. If you got rich playing with it, I, you know, that's great. Uh, okay. So are there any burning questions? Uh, not that I can see. So, uh, let's move on to a better topic. I cannot stand this. Uh, let's see. What was I going to do? Oh, um, I guess this was it. Uh, Bitcoin veteran Anthony Pompilano disavows crypto price predictions after incorrect 100,000 BTC forecast. So, uh, he, Pompilo, uh, people are wondering why he removed his laser eyes on his Twitter profile and why he took out his uh, hashtag Bitcoin on his uh, Twitter profile. Um, and uh, this is the nub of it. He said, in June of 2019, with Bitcoin sitting around 12,000, I predicted that the asset would rise to 100,000 within 2.5 years. Rather than the eight by uh, increase, Bitcoin only went up six by, <laughs> six times in that time frame. Some people would argue that the difference doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, I was wrong. Uh, it was a great reminder that humans can't predict the future and price predictions are a fool's game. Bitcoin helped to humble me. Um, an interesting perspective, right? I have maintained that price predictions uh, are not an exact science. Uh, there's a lot of chartists out there that will tell you, uh, you know, oh, we're going to hit this price, we're going to hit that price. Um, but at the end of the day, no one can predict exactly uh, what a market's going to do, whether it's Bitcoin, pork bellies, you know, electricity, uh, whatever is being traded, right? There's no way to exactly predict uh, a future price, right? We cannot predict the future accurately. Um, and I, th I get the feeling that the reason he did this, I don't know, uh, did any of you see uh, Cool Hand Luke? Um, if you remember Cool Hand Luke, which is, if you've never seen Cool Hand, cool Hand Luke with uh, Paul Newman, you've got to see it. Uh, and just a great movie. But... In the movie, uh, he came in to this uh, chain gang prison and uh, was on the low totem pole the, and then sort of gained uh, a reputation, right? Uh, he, was a, he wasn't a quitter. Uh, he was kind of a rebel. And then he was sort of, as the movie progressed, he was kind of elevated to this hero status, and uh, at one point, George Kennedy was like talking to him and going, ah, you knew all along that that was going to happen. And, you know, you um, you're a, I don't know, you're the you're the man or whatever. And like he Paul Newman just kind of screamed, you know, it's like, stop feeding off me. <laughs> and that's probably what was happening to Pomp. Right. People were just hanging on his every word. And, you know, what, what's your Bitcoin prediction today, Pomp? You know, what's, what's going to happen today? And, like, he's like, dude, stop feeding off me. Just leave me alone. Uh, he probably just got overwhelmed by all the attention and the, you know, the people that were looking up to him as this Bitcoin hero. Um, you know, what's, the, what's your price prediction? You know, uh, he has, uh, he, he wrote a letter. Uh, which I believe is this link here. And he goes into, you know, some detail. Uh, you know, there's that paragraph that we were talking about. Uh, but, you know, he's talking about uh, he doesn't want to, like, be, uh, tie his identity to an asset. Um, so you can kind of see, like, he just wanted to uh, be uh, not, tied to the price like every day you know his his whole existence was being tied to bitcoin right because of his uh 
you know, his status in the, the community. So I think he wanted to kind of step back from that. He got tired of people like feeding off his energy, I guess, like, you know, the prisoners were feeding off of Luke's energy. Uh, so that's, the, I, that's kind of what I got if I, you know, you read this whole thing. Now, all these stories are uh, linked down below in the description. If you want to read the entire stories, <clears throat> all of the stories, you can check them out. I've got links to them. And then if you want to read that full letter, there's a link to that full letter in the story uh, from uh, Daily Hoddle, right? There's a link there to that story. Uh, of his his full letter. Uh, okay, so here we are. Um, I wanted to uh, got through the news kind of quick. <laughs> I want to try to get to some stuff uh, tonight, right? Do some stuff. Uh, we're gonna buy and transfer some crypto. Um, let's see. Oh, I have a list of things I want to buy. Um, let's see, where should I start? <laughs> um, well, let's talk a little bit about Google Authenticator. I did drop a, another Google Authenticator video uh, in, concerning the new iPhone, right? Because I'm planning on getting the new iPhone. And I've done several videos on... Uh, how to use Google Authenticator, how to migrate Google Authenticator to a new phone, uh, how to recover your, uh, well, there's really no, if you, well, I, I've done videos on how to uh, restore Google Authenticator from backup if you had the, the forethought to write down your backup codes. But most of the questions that I get from people are what to do when they lose their phone completely, right? Um, most people, uh, that use Google authenticator don't realize that when you get yourself a new phone and you migrate your apps onto the new phone, your codes, your Google codes do not migrate, right? Because of the nature of Google authenticator, it is a device specific application. So when you transfer the Google authenticator app, from your old phone to your new phone, those codes do not automatically transfer because it's based, it's a device-based uh, security app, right? So it wouldn't make sense for you to just willy-nilly be able to transfer it from device to device, right? So what you have to do is a, uh, an export. Uh, so I, I, I dropped this video. I've done a video similar to this before. But I just felt that since the new iPhones were coming out, there might be a lot of people out there that would fall into this trap of uh, doing that migration, especially uh, because the phone is very expensive, right? So a lot of people would fall into that trap of uh, doing their trade-up, right? Either at the store or at the Apple store, or the, the Verizon store, the AT&T store, or ordering a new phone online and then having to send the old phone back, right? That's fairly common. And a lot of people will wipe their old phone and send it back before they realize they don't have any Google codes, right? So uh, I did this video to, you know, how do you migrate Google Authenticator, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're in Google Authenticator, there are three dots up here uh, that uh, will allow you to export your accounts. Uh, and when you do that, um, it's going to show you a QR code, which you will scan with the new phone uh, or whatever phone you're transferring over to. Usually it's going to be a new phone, right? You're, so, uh, But you have to do this. Uh, because it will not occur automatically when you just uh, migrate your phone settings over to a new device, right? It has to be done from within Google Authenticator. So most of the questions that I get uh, concerning Google Authenticator are, well, what do I do now that I wiped my old phone? <laughs> and I'm like, you, nothing, you're done. You know, you wiped your old phone, so now you don't have any Google codes anymore. You're done. 
right? That's the whole idea of Google Authenticator is that only the person with the phone has the uh, power to, you know, log into these to whatever accounts you've enabled two-factor authentication on. It wouldn't be a very good authenticator if it were really easy to recover it, you know? It's supposed to be hard, right? That's the whole idea. So if you lose your phone, if you step on your phone, if you wipe your phone, you're done. You, there's not, you have to be cognizant of this when you use Google Authenticator and properly migrate your settings onto your new phone. All right, that's just all there is to it. Now, if you don't, uh, let's take a look at, uh, if you uh, wipe your old phone, whoops, Uh, if you wipe your old phone, you're done, right? The only thing you can do when you wipe your phone is the, the phone is no longer a part of the equation, right? Now the focus, once the phone is gone, is getting access to your accounts, right? And you can't use the phone to do that anymore. So you have to go, like, for example, if you've got Coinbase... Binance US, uh, KuCoin, all you know with 2FA and you lose your device, you have to go into each of those uh, accounts, websites, and tell them, oh, I lost my device, right? And then you got to jump through a whole bunch of hoops to get two-factor disabled on the account, right? And then once you've done that, then you can log into the account with, without your device, right? So the phone doesn't come into play at all, basically, when you lose it, right? You have to go into each account and painstakingly disable two-factor so you can get into your accounts. And that is it's horrible, right? Especially if you've got 10 different accounts, right? It's not easy. It can be done, right? So, But God forbid you have any crypto in any of those accounts that you can't access. Because even... In the best case scenario, you lose access to your account for several days, right? Just to get your dis your two factor disabled, right? You ha first you have to submit the request, and then it might take twenty four hours for them to get back to you. And then once they've like uh, verified you and said, "Okay, we get it. You're trying to turn off your two FA." takes another, you know, three to five business days for them to actually disable it. And all that time, you cannot get into your account, right? So uh, this is another argument for why it's good to have your crypto in your own wallet, right? So if you've managed to lose access to your cryptocurrency accounts, but you have your coins in your own wallet, well, then you could just open new accounts and trade that way. Right? Although it's not easy to open a new account if you have an existing account that's been disabled, right? Because you, you might try to you know set up the account and they'll say, oh, you've already got an account. You know? So anyway, <laughs> a little lecture from Crypto Dad. Uh, which one is better, Google Authenticator or Authy? Uh, I believe I would have to say that Authy. Uh, is better in the sense that you have a backup because it does store your codes uh, encrypted uh, but in a cloud so that if you lose your device, you can recover your codes to a new device, right? All you have to do is authenticate yourself. There's a way to do that, right? So in that sense, Authy is a better, it has a better backup mechanism. The only problem with Authy is that not every service supports Authy, right? There's a lot of services that only support Google Authenticator. Google Authenticator is kind of like Kleenex or Coca-Cola, right? Uh, you can't buy Pepsi everywhere, right? Well, now you can, but, but that, like, you can anywhere in the, I think there, every, there, every country in the world you can buy a Coke, right? Almost. I think there's only two countries. Uh, and I think it's North Korea and Iran. No, I don't think it's Iran. I, I know it's North Korea where you can't buy. That's the only, there's only two countries in the world where you can't buy Coke, 
right? But you may not be able to buy, you know, Perrier in every country of the world. So that's the way Google Authenticator is too. It is the it is the recognized two factor service. Uh, and so most, I mean, every, almost every site that supports 2FA supports Google Authenticator, but not every site out there supports Authy. So that's its only, you know, drawback is that it's not universally supported like Google is. Uh, would you, how would you explain to a non-believer who says BTC has no value why you are investing in BTC? Well, that's one for the ages. Um, there's, uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's hard to convince anyone of anything these days because, uh, the world really no longer runs on, uh, logic and reason. Right. Everything is narrative now. So, I mean, you try to argue with someone about anything and uh, it's like you're challenging their religious beliefs. Right. So, uh, you know, when someone hears something on TV, on the mainstream media uh, or, you know, on a mainstream website or they 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 go and they look at a fact checker website, <laughs> they're going to they're not going to listen to anything you have to say about Bitcoin, if they've already made up their mind that it's worthless. But, uh, I mean, one thing you can tell them is that it's still around uh, after all this time when, uh, you know, people said Bitcoin was dead in they've written its epitaph many times, right? So you can say that. Um, and it's always, it's still around, right? Even price-wise, um, you know, it's around 20,000 now. Well, for two and a half years, people were comparing Bitcoin to its 20,000 peak of, of 2017. And they would bash it and they would say, oh, it was 20,000 in 2017 and look at it now, you know, fail, you know. Well, now that it's back over 20,000, they don't have that argument anymore, right? Even though it's way, now their argument is, well, it's off its high. It was at 67,000 and now look at it. It's back it's back at 20. You're like, "Well, yeah, but last year you were telling me that it would never hit 20 again." It also has use case, right? Um, it is a decentralized uh, currency. It's a new form of money. It is an emergent technology based on uh, advanced cryptography that uh, is a currency is not controlled by uh, central banks. It, it is not a, you know, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network maintained by volunteers. You can send uh, value across the room or across the world with equal ease. I mean, there are so many points you can make about Bitcoin, right, to a non-believer. But like I said, you're, if they've already made up their mind, you're not going to be able to convince them. What can I say? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move some crypto around. Um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to buy some XRP. Oh, and by the way, this, I don't know what this video is at, at the moment. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to views. I'm, I'm wondering this video about how to recover your Google codes, uh, is, approaching a million views. It'll be my first video with a million views. It took a few years, but uh, it's almost, it's, it has almost cracked 900,000. So I don't know, it might take another six months to break a million, but that'll be a milestone for me. As you can see, my most popular videos are the ones I did about Google Authenticator. All right, so uh, let's see. Well, I uh, want to... Uh, let's buy some XRP, right? Uh, can we buy XRP on Coinbase? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, XRP. No. Uh, we're talking about Ripple here. Um, can we buy XRP on Binance US? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, XRP? No. 
how in the heck are we going to get our hands on XRP? Right? Um, where can I buy XRP? Well, let's go over to uh, an exchange called KuCoin. And uh, do they have XRP? Uh, yes, they do. All right. So uh, how am I going to buy XRP on KuCoin? Well, uh, KuCoin uh, does not do fiat deposits, right? But you can, I believe you can buy um, U.S. Tether uh, with your uh, credit card or ATM card, right? But they don't do, I don't think they do wire transfers as far as I know. And But in order to do this, you have to do some KYC or whatever to make this happen, right? Well, let's see, what else they got? V Visa card, oh, it looks like they support Zelle. I didn't know that. Oh, and Cash App, okay. Uh, but no, like, direct ACH uh, transfers, you know, uh, to, you know, you don't, you can't connect your bank account directly to them. And I think the reason they do that is so that they don't, that they can avoid uh, certain uh, scrutiny, right, regulations, right? So they're kind of a pure cryptocurrency exchange. So, and, but this is, it's been like this for years. There were uh, certain cryptocurrency exchanges that had coins you couldn't get on Coinbase or whatever, KuCoin, I'm sorry, uh, Kraken, your U.S.-based exchanges. Actually, I think you can buy XRP on Kraken. Um, but, uh, well, let's just check. Oops, I had to put my hardware, I had to put my, I don't know what you call that thing. <laughs> uh, it's two-factor hardware thing. All right, let's see if you can buy it on Kraken. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's been kind of uh, delisted from almost, oh, it's a Yubi key. That's it, my Yubi key. Okay. Oh, no, it's not working. Ah, doggone it. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to pull it out and put it back in again. It was in there backwards, actually. <laughs> Easy thing to do. All right, so let's press it. There it goes. All right, so let's get in here and see if we can buy... All right. Uh, let's see. Where's that? Oh, buy crypto. Okay. Let's see here. XRP? No. Cannot buy it there either. Okay. So we're kind of stuck. Uh, so how do we fund a cryptocurrency exchange so that we can make a trade, right? If I want to buy some XRP. Well, uh, let's go over to spot trading and see what trading pairs they have for XRP. Well, let's see. We got uh, XRP. Uh, looks like you can... Okay, so they have a lot of XRP trading pairs. We can uh, use uh, US dollar, or, or I'm sorry, US tether, uh, US dollar coin. Uh, I think that's true US dollar. And uh, there's XRP ETH and XRP Bitcoin, right? So we can... So we could deposit some Ethereum or Bitcoin on this exchange and trade for XRP. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just do Tether. We'll see how that works. Uh, and I'm going to have to uh, endure some fees for this to make this happen. Um, I, I think I might, the cheapest way, and I might be wrong, but the, oh, you can buy it in, on Uphold. Okay, yeah, I've heard that. You can buy uh, up XRP on Uphold. I had pulled up Uphold because someone mentioned Uphold earlier. They said it took like 24 hours to withdraw some ADA from Uphold or whatever. So I was going to like play around with Uphold. But I logged into my account and they want me, uh, this is my account needs attention. I need to resubmit my identity document. I've done this like, I don't know how many times I've done this, but I'm sick of it. I don't know what it is about this. I've, I've 
done my identity several times and they just keep wanting more from me or to redo it or whatever. So I'm like, I'm kind of done with Uphold. I don't understand why it doesn't stick when I submit all my ID stuff. They just, and I guess part of it is they keep ratcheting up the requirements, right? Regulatory wise. I'm like, first, first they wanted, you know, my phone number and okay. Then they wanted, uh, you know, my, my ID, you know, and, uh, did that you know, now? Oh, now they got to have my social security number, and I got to answer questions like how much do I plan on trading, and all this just more and more and more info. So I don't know why, and I thought I had done all of it, but apparently not. Right? They still want more from me. <laughs> but can you? Okay, markets. All right, Co. I guess you can buy XRP here. Whoops. Whoops. So you can buy it on Uphold. Okay. But I don't know if I can do it. I don't have any uh, payment methods connected to my Uphold account. I just get, I, the only reason I use it is because BAT rewards go in there. And then I withdraw my BAT. So anyway, uh, let's stick with this strategy, right? Let's use Tether. Uh, let's go, and I'm going to buy, I'll buy it on uh, Binance US. Right, so let's hit buy. Uh, we'll use my bank account. Uh, we'll choose Tether. Um, now, if I use Bitcoin, I think my fees would be less. Although I know that uh, Binance US has a, like a flat Bitcoin withdrawal fee, which I think is like 20 or 30 bucks. So let's see if how much they're going to charge me to withdraw my tether, right? So we'll do a hundred. Uh, we'll we'll buy a hundred dollars worth of tether. Looks like I'm hitting that merchant charge pretty. They're hitting me with one twenty five merchant charge on a hundred bucks. Okay. Whatever. Let's go ahead and do that. All right. So apparently I've managed to buy this tether, right? Actually, there was some tether in there already. So uh, it's going to be more than 100, right? Uh, there it is. I just bought it and said it's successful. All right, and there we go. So like I said, there was already a little bit of Tether in there. So we've got a fair amount of Tether, right? So now we want to deposit it in our KuCoin account. So for KuCoin, you go to your you have to go to your main account. They separate your main account from your trading account. Like a security measure. Let's go to US dollar tether. Let's do a deposit. And we'll use the oh well, they got a bunch of networks here. Binance Smart Chain is unavailable. That would have been cheaper. Um, I don't know that I would have been able to withdraw Tether on that chain. Let's check. Um, yeah, I could have, actually. But uh, And that would have been cheaper. But apparently, uh, KuCoin is not accepting uh, Binance Smart Chain deposits of Tether. Right? So we'll stick with ERC-20. There's our ERC-20 address. And we're going to make a uh, exchange to exchange transfer, which I'm not a huge fan of. I usually like to go from exchange to wallet, uh, my own wallet, or wallet to exchange, right? It just kind of keeps things less complicated. Um, because if something goes wrong uh, and it's exchange to exchange, they, you know, they can kind of blame each other. Well, well you got to call Binance about that, or you, you got to call KuCoin about that. So, but anyway, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna throw caution to the wind. I'm gonna do an exchange to exchange transfer. All right, we got this uh, address copied into our clipboard. We'll go over here and make our withdraw on uh, the ERC twenty network. We'll go ahead and just do it all. Actually, I'm gonna take these decimals off. What happened? What what is that all about? Okay, let's try this again. Uh, I'm just going to type it in. <laughs> there we go. 125. Uh, let's paste in that address of our KuCoin account. Let's hit preview withdrawal. 
How much are they going to charge me? Another three bucks. So we're at like five bucks now of, of fees, right? So let's hit confirm withdrawal. Uh, I got to put in my Google Authenticator code. So let's do that. Hit done there. Off it goes. Uh, oh, I've got to, uh, let's see. We got to get this email here. Please watch Cool Hand Luke if you've never seen it. Such a good movie. Uh, let's see. I think it's this email. <laughs> Such a good movie. All right, let's hit confirm withdrawal here. All right, so it's gone. All right, now, I don't know. Sometimes uh, withdrawals can take, like, crazy amounts of time, depending on the situation. I've seen withdrawals uh, hit my KuCoin account within minutes. I've seen it take hours. Uh, I had a 24-hour one before, too. I've had, I think it's happened to me a couple of times, usually with smaller cryptocurrencies. When I make a deposit into KuCoin, it takes a while. And I've even, like, submitted support tickets with them, uh, you know. But it always gets there eventually. And usually it's within, within 48 hours. I've never had a deposit never get there, right? But I have had them take, like, over 24 hours. So we'll kind of keep an eye on it. We'll buy something else maybe. Uh, you can go over here to history. And ah, there's some Luke. <laughs> See, if I'd have just held on to that, right? But 1800 Luke, Luna Classic, is, was probably worth like five cents anyway. Uh, so deposit, right? So that's uh, within the last month I've made that deposit. So we still haven't seen the deposit of the... Um, tether yet so we'll have to wait a minute on that while we're waiting for that uh let's go ahead and maybe just buy some bitcoin over here let's see what have we got well i don't know let me see what you guys are asking Uh, let's see. Yesterday I tried to send my Ethereum from Binance to my MetaMask and they said I have to wait 10 days. Yeah, uh, because, uh, that is their policy, 10 days, right? Um, the reason, I believe the reason that I was able to immediately withdraw my Tether is because I have some, uh, uh, collateral in my account, right? You can see I have a balance in my Binance US account. So uh, they're prob they've probably earmarked uh, $100. So if I try to withdraw everything, they'll probably not let me withdraw that last 100 because they're waiting 10 days for the uh, bank transfer, right, to confirm. Right. So if you have like a zero balance in your account and you the, the account's fairly new uh, and you make that deposit and then try to withdraw immediately, it's going to tell you you have to wait 10 days. All right. I've had that harmony in my account for months and months and months. So I always have that like cushion so that when I make a... a a purchase I can withdraw immediately because I still have some collateral in the account that they can hold, you know. So, but yeah, if you have a zero balance, it's going to take 10 days before they'll let you withdraw the crypto. Um, let's see here. Oh, Slapshot's another good Paul Newman film. Yay. <laughs> I haven't, I don't think I've seen that. Isn't that one where it's a hockey? He's a hockey coach or something? Hmm, I don't know. Oh, The Hustler is also a great Paul Newman movie. Not to mention Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and The Sting. Of course, The Sting. If you haven't seen The Sting, man, you got to watch that too. Uh, how to send NFT to Ledger. Can I make a video on how to send an NFT to Ledger? Actually, I have a video on that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's go over here. 
uh, not a very old video either. So still uh, a good, uh, you know, it's not out of date. It's a fairly recent video. So I show you how to purchase an NFT on uh, OpenSea and store it in your ledger. You're basically, you know, you just basically you just connect your ledger wallet to OpenSea. And so when you make a purchase, it goes right into your wallet, right? Which is in this case ledger based. So boom, there you go. There's an answer to your question. It's not an it's not a like a pat answer, right? This is several steps. But I do have it divided up into chapters. And this is just one uh platform, right? OpenSea. But basically you can move NFTs from wallet to wallet, just like you would uh, any token, right? We can move NFTs back and forth between our wallets. Uh, as long as you have some Ethereum in there to cover gas fees, they're just like any other transfer. Pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Uh, what Bitcoin account type do you use for my ledger? It gives me four types. I use the latest one, which is... Um, Oh, let's open Ledger Live. Uh, Native SegWit. Native SegWit is the latest uh, Bitcoin protocol format, address format. So I would use Native SegWit. I, it's, I don't think there's any reason to use old SegWit accounts anymore because most places fully support Native SegWit now. It's been around since 2017. Or 18, I don't know. It's, it's been around a while now, right? So he, what they're is talking about. Uh, let's see. We want to add an account, and you want to add a Bitcoin account. M mine's going to take a while because there's a bunch of Bitcoin accounts on here. Um, let's see if I'm doing. I hope I'm doing this right. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I've been using this ledger for a while, so there are a lot of empty accounts. I'm just kind of a tidy nut, and after I've used a Bitcoin wallet for a while, I'll just start a new one. Uh, it's not really that necessary, um, but I I do. I'm just I'm a I'm a little weird that way. We we had a really long discussion about and a lot of back and forth about um, if you have a Bitcoin wallet that has never uh, made, you've never withdrawn from it, it's technically it's more secure because you've never exposed the public key. And that's kind of a cryptography thing. Uh, when you send Bitcoin out of a wallet, you of necessity, you have to send your public key out onto the blockchain it's not really seen but it's used to verify the transaction right um, so uh, my contention is that if it's if it's a bitcoin deposit only wallet it's more secure because it only you've created the private key and they would have to crack your private key but if you have exposed your public key then theoretically with uh Oh, I don't. I don't know what that stuff's called. Again, I can't think of it. Quantum computing, they might be able to crack your public key and work backwards, which is technically impossible at this point in time. There are no computers capable of cracking a public key. But anyway, I digress. Right. Anyway, uh, your question was about types of Bitcoin wallets, right? They have native SegWit, Taproot, SegWit, and Legacy. There's no really any reason to use any of those old ones unless you are some kind of aficionado and you have a specific reason for using those other types of wallets. Native SegWit is the latest one. It's the most common, and almost everybody supports it. A couple of years ago, there you might like try to make a withdrawal to a native SegWit wallet and your exchange might tell you it's invalid because they didn't support native SegWit wallet addresses, but now they do. Almost every exchange does. 
So, but as you can see, um, I have a Bitcoin main, which is a native SegWit, but I also maintain this other one, Bitcoin Affiliate, which is an old SegWit wallet, just in case, all right? Just in case somebody, I don't know what taproot, the, the significance or benefit of having a taproot account would be. Maybe it's better. I'm not sure. But native SegWit is the default, and it's probably your best bet. Hey, birds, bees, and trees, you're here again. It's nice to have you here. Uh, just bought my first two NFTs today. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we have... Um, I have uh, some NFTs in some of these wallets. Let's see here. Let's take a look at Ethereum main. Uh, okay, yeah, there's like this little dumb little NFT. We can uh, move it. Let's move it uh, over to uh, this one. Yeah, this is like, okay, so we get the address of the wallet. Um, which is an ERC-20 address, right? That's our destination. And then we go over to the uh, wallet where the NFT is. All right. And then we, you know, we click on the NFT and we can just send that NFT over to the other wallet. You just give it the address, right? And notice here that it's going to charge me a little bit of Ethereum fees. Thank you so much, Perkster. I appreciate that. All right, let's hit continue. And then um, we're going to need to authorize this, right? We, we need to authorize whenever we send Bitcoin out. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn on the camera. I hope the camera's working tonight. Okay, that's good. Cool. If you guys can see that, all right, this is uh, my uh, ledger device. We'll hit continue. And now it wants me to open the Ethereum app, right? I have to authorize this outgoing transaction. All right, there is the overview. Uh, the fees, I didn't look at the fees. Oh, yeah, we looked at them. They're like less than two bucks. Like it's not, it's not going to kill me. I'm going to do an NFT transfer to this address. Uh, that's got the collection name on there. That's the address of the NFT. All right, there's one. There's my fees. And then accept and send. All right, so it's basically just like making a transfer from wallet to wallet. We can hit view details, and we can even check on the Explorer, and it says it, it was successful, right? So that was pretty easy. Uh, let's take a look in the other wallet, see if it came in. Right, It just cost me a little bit of Ethereum to do this. So let's go over to, I think it was Ethereum main, right? Or we did we send it? We sent we sent it to Ethereum hidden. There it is. Just came in. See, so it's it's just like moving an ERC twenty token. There's nothing really mysterious about it. Um, back in uh, a couple years, a year back or so, uh, Ethereum fees were ridiculously high, and it costs generally cost more to move an NFT than, say, an ERC-20 token or Ethereum. But lately, Ethereum fees have been pretty low. Uh, and I uh, let's hope that holds after the merge. We don't know. Could go up, could go down. For We don't know for sure. But anyway, uh, it has to do with the scaling of the Ethereum network. When the Ethereum network uh, is overloaded, then fees go up. All right, but that one didn't cost me very much to just move an NFT. Just like moving tokens from one place to another. Let's check over here and see what's going on in KuCoin. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so we got our uh, U.S. dollar tether. We can breathe a sigh of relief. It didn't really take that long, actually. Uh, now we need to move that into our trading account. So let's see. Where is it? Super -doo -doo. 
Okay. Oh, it was an overview, right? Ah, here we go. So we're going to transfer uh, from the main account to our trading all of that UST, right? This is kind of a security thing they've got, right? You have to, it's, it's, they, they separate. You, uh, but actually, I believe you can deposit directly into the trading account. So I'm not really sure why they have that separation, but they do. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. Okay, good. All right, so now we can buy our XRP, right? XRP. Uh, and we have the tether in there, right? So uh, let's hit US dollar tether. And I'm just going to do a um, market. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to move myself up so you guys can see what's going on down here. So I'm going to click market. And uh, we're going to buy XRP with our UST. We'll use 100% of it. So um, I guess they're charging us a little bit. All right. And there we go. I'll move myself back down. Whoops. I don't know what the heck I'm doing tonight. All right, let's move myself back down. The floating head. Uh, let's see. Now we can go to assets. I don't believe you can withdraw directly from the trading account, right? So you need to move. You need to, uh, you know, transfer from the trading back into the main. Right, and this time we'll do X XRP. All right, I'll hit that. Let's hit confirm, and there it goes. So now, uh, if we go to the main account, we've got XRP, shouldn't we? Did I do it or did I not do it? I thought I did. Okay, there it is. All right, so now I want to put it in my wallet. Right, so let's do that. We can go over to Ledger Live. We can go over to Accounts. Let's go to this XRP account. And we'll do a receive. Now, this is where a lot of people get confused about XRP. You do not need uh, a tag to deposit XRP into your own wallet. Right? But the exchange will ask you if you have a tag. And people get confused. And they're like, the exchange wants a tag. How do I get the tag? Like you don't get the tag, you ignore that, right? So we'll open up XRP. Oh, this is the confirmation of the receive, right? Okay, so there's the address. Verify it. We'll eyeball it. Let's just confirm that this address is associated with this device, right? I've copied it into my clipboard. Let's go back over here. Let's do withdraw. Um, and the network will be XRP. There's only one. It's only going to cost me 17 cents. That's cool. There's no tag, right? You must fill in tag correctly to withdraw XRP or the funds may be lost, right? So uh, let's put in the address, All right? And am I going to be, how can I do this or can I not do this? Hmm. Ah, okay. Uh, so I'm going to do it all. Actually, I can turn this thing off for a sec. Get out of the way. I can do it all, right? So notice here it's asking me to enter the tag, but I don't have to because I know I don't need it. But a lot of people get freaked out, and I get a lot of questions like, how do, why don't, how come Ledger won't give me a tag, right? It doesn't, you don't need a tag, Although every exchange will warn you that you should be using a tag if you're going exchange to exchange. But we're not. We're going to exchange to wallet. So we don't need the tag. All right, let's go back. Let's go ahead and do the withdraw. Don't withdraw to an ICO. We're not withdrawing to our wallet. Let's hit that withdraw. And I'm going to have to go through. This network supports tags. Make sure if... Make sure if a tag is required. It's not required, so now we hit continue. All right, there's an overview of what we're doing. We'll hit confirm here. Uh, th this is always a little tricky here. 
I need my trading password. Can I get it? Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, now I need my email code. All right, I got to check my email. They're going to send me this code. All right, there's our code for our whoops. There's our withdrawal code. Mm -hmm. Let's paste that guy in there. Now we're running out of time. Now we need the 2FA code from our Google Authenticator for KuCoin. All right, we'll hit submit there. I'm running out of time. Okay. Withdraw initiated. Okay. They've changed their interface slightly. Uh, save address. Eh, we don't need to serve it. Okay. All right. So uh, now we're in recent withdrawals. Uh, received. Okay, so they've received my request for the withdrawal, right? We can go over to history and go to withdrawal and see that now it's processing out. You could also see this on the, the XRP page, right? Like you can just, I thought you could just click on that. I guess not. <laughs> I guess you have to go to the withdrawal page, right? So, yeah, you can see it down here in the withdrawal page. And then we can just watch it over here in our wallet, right? Now that I've done all that, um, I'll just go ahead and uh, confirm that address and approve it. I don't know why, but if you confirm it, it disappears. So it's just kind of dumb. I just wanted to kind of leave it up there. I forgot to do that last little eyeball check to make sure... You know, we had the correct address, but we'll see. If it doesn't come in, we'll know, right? Um, and I think it's fairly fast, right? Let's see how long it takes before it shows up. Uh, that was it, right? Came in. So uh, down here, we can see that we received it. And it's confirmed already, right? XRP is pretty fast. So there we go, right? So we bought XRP, but we had to do a little bit of uh, finagling, right? We had to, you know, I have, I have uh, access to uh, my assets, but only through my bank and my uh, U.S. exchanges, right? But I wanted to buy XRP, so I had to... Uh, use kind of a different, uh, an, uh, a non-U.S. cryptocurrency exchange. And in order to fund that trade, I had to buy some crypto and move it over there. So I could have bought Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, or Tether, or even U.S. dollar coin, and moved it into my KuCoin account. I could have bought any one of those four on, U on Binance U.S. I just went ahead and did Tether. And you saw it kind of cost me. But the reason I used Tether was because I figured it'd be kind of quick. Might have been better off doing Ethereum. Might have been just as quick with maybe smaller fees. I don't know. But I know that Bitcoin is like a flat withdrawal fee on Binance US. So that would have probably cost us 20 or 30 bucks. So, and there we go. Where is the cat, man? I don't know. The cat was up here earlier. Uh, <laughs> but he's not here now. I don't know where he is now. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Any burning questions? Uh, I just got my Ledger Nano X today. Can a VP, VPN be used to transfer my crypto to the Ledger? Um, if It doesn't matter whether you just use your regular internet connection or a VPN, you'll still, you know, Ledger Live will still connect to the blockchain, right, through the internet. And so if you're using a VPN, it doesn't really matter. It'll, it should work. I've never really tried it, but I'm sure it, it shouldn't make any difference, really. The 
Ledger Live just runs on top of whatever internet connection you're using. So if you're using a VPN, it'll just run on top of that. Should work. Uh, let's see, what else can we do? Oh, I wanted to kind of cover uh, this whole, let me see if we're here yet. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about Binance Smart Chain wallets with my Ledger device. Um, so let's do let's do BNB because I, I know there's a little bit of BNB on here already in my uh, Binance US wallet, right? There's a little bit of, of BNB token in here. So a lot of people will ask me, how do I get B, uh, Binance Smart Chain tokens on my ledger, right? They always say that. On, I want to put it on my ledger, even though we know that that's not accurate. The ledger device is a key, not a wallet. It's like a key, and this, this little device here is like your keychain to all your wallets. Your crypto is stored on blockchain, uh, but I get it. I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, I want to use a uh, ledger protected wallet and I get it right so but how do we do that right how do we uh, put binance smart chain tokens in a ledger based wallet right well you can do it in ledger live right so if you go to ledger live they support binance smart chain with the binance smart chain app All right so let me just I'll just get rid of this real quick so uh, let's confirm that. So if I have a Ledger device and I want to set up a Binance Smart Chain account, then uh, we just go over here to Add Account and we choose uh, B Binance Smart Chain, right? They have it down here. Binance Smart Chain or BNB, right? So we'll hit Continue. Um, and if we don't have the Binance Smart Chain app, it'll ask us, it'll install it for us automatically. But I already have it on here, so it's asking me to just open it, right? So we'll go ahead and open it. Usually when people say on my ledger, they mean they want to see it in Ledger Live, which I understand that too. Because you can do this in MetaMask as well, and I'll show you what I mean. But most people want to see it on their in their Ledger Live, right? You can see I've already got a couple accounts set up. Let's stick with this. Well, we'll just put them both on there. What the heck? Uh, okay, so we'll hit Add Account, and then we'll hit Done. And we'll go down here. Here's one, right? So... Uh, the Binance Smart Chain wallet has been set up, and there's already some BNB in there, right? Because the wallet was already created by the device in the past. So your ledger will remember. So if you wipe uh, accounts out of Ledger Live, or even if you delete the app on your device, all you have to do is reinstall the app, and it'll remember the wallet that was there before. It's math, right? So as you can see, I have a Binance Smart Chain wallet set up here now, and uh, there's some Binance Smart Chain tokens in here. Uh, so how do we move uh, you know, new crypto into this wallet? Well, uh, just like we would any other wallet, we hit Receive. Uh, we get the address, which is there it is. Very similar to an uh, Ethereum address, right? Because... Binance Smart Chain is based on the Ethereum network, right? Runs on the EVM, right? The Binance, I'm sorry, the Ethereum virtual machine. I'm going to turn this camera off real quick. I don't need it anymore, right? I've got the address, right? So we'll copy the address into, oop, <laughs> oops. Let's do that again. Copy the address into our clipboard. Verify the address on the device. We'll hit done. All right. Now uh, let's go over to uh, Binance US. And uh, I bought some BNB. This would hold for any Binance Smart Chain type token. Uh, I don't know that they have any. Oh, 
well, actually, I think they like the tether. Oh, they <laughs> they're still showing the tether is in my account, right? Even though I've already sold it and traded it for e whatever. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think I can do Binance US dollar, right? If I want to make a withdrawal here, I can use the Binance Smart Chain for my Binance US dollar, right? We'll paste in that address, and we'll just do 10. I don't know. I don't think they're going to charge me that much, All right? We'll hit preview withdrawal, and uh, I think it's so low it's not even showing up. Or maybe because it's Binance US dollar, their native stablecoin. I don't know. Once it confirm, I got to put in my Google Authenticator code. I'm going to let this one cycle. 825500. All right. Whoops. Is that right? Okay, yeah. All right, let's go check that email. Confirm that withdrawal. Off it goes. We have a pending withdrawal of Binance US dollar on the Binance Smart Chain network, right? We use the BSC, B, or what they call BEP20, right? There's Binance Smart Chain, BSC, and BEP20. They're just terms, all terms for the same thing. Binance Smart Chain network, blockchain, you want to call it that. Let's go over here. Uh, let's see if we do the sync. We should see that. Oh, let's hit open this up. There, just came in, right? Binance US dollar 10, right? So there we go. Uh, and now it's in there and that's all well and good, but the, the better way if you want to manage Binance Smart Chain tokens on your ledger, right? You want to use, like I said, some people when they say I want it, on my ledger, they mean they want to see it in Ledger Live, right? This Ledger Live software. They want to see it as an account in Ledger Live. But really, if you want to really take advantage of the Binance Smart Chain and all of its advantages and features and all the DEXs and the liquidity pools, you really, this is really not the best way to do it, right? Because you're pretty much. The only thing you've got is deposit and withdrawal, right? You can't stake, you can't trade, you can't really do much of anything in Ledger Live. You can see it, right? It's there. But if you really want to take advantage of Binance Smart Chain, you should be over in MetaMask. And I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to... First thing I'll do is... Get rid of. <laughs> I have so many, I don't know what to do. Um, oh, that's Ledger S. Let's do this one. Let's get rid of this. Okay. Um, and let's get rid of the other one, too. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, I've got this nifty little ledger device, and I want to play around with Binance Smart Chain, but I want to use like PancakeSwap or something cool, right? But I still want to store my Binance tokens on a ledger based in a ledger based wallet, right? So in that case, I need to, and let's let's go all the way, right? Let's go. Let's go. Oh, I have to switch off it. Okay. Let's go to here. Let's go to networks. Let's go to Binance. Whoops. Dog on it. Ah. Uh, dog on it. Well, I wanted to delete it, but I can't. How do I do that? Oh, oh there. 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 Do, 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 do. Okay. There. All right. All right. So uh, I'm in uh, a uh, MetaMask wallet, right? I've got this little nifty device. And I would like to start playing around with Binance Smart Chain, right? Well, first I need to configure it in MetaMask. So uh, you could uh, do a Google. 
and say uh, Binance. Mm -hmm. Smart Chain. MetaMask, right? And they would give you instructions on how you set up Binance Smart Chain in MetaMask, right? And the thing is this stuff right here. You need this uh, UR, this RPC R URL, this chain ID, and uh, this stuff. And th that's where you go into MetaMask and you say, I want to uh, create a new network, wherever it is. <laughs> uh, come on, why does it keep doing it this way? I don't really want to do it that way. But hey, whatever. All right, we want to add a network, right? And this is the information that we need to put in, right? I need to put in, you know, we call this Binance Smart Chain, right? And then I need this URL. All right, we'll do all this. I don't know what it's, it doesn't like that. <laughs> Why doesn't it like that? I don't get it. Is it because there was a space in the front of it? Okay. And back until I've got all these settings in here. But there is an easier way to do this, right? Much, much easier way to do this is to go over to a uh, site called chainlist.org. And um, I want to connect my wallet, which is like it connects to my MetaMask wallet. And then I want to uh, add this network to my MetaMask, right? So add MetaMask, right? There. It already filled all those settings there for me automatically. I didn't have to, like, cut and paste them one by one, right? We'll approve. And then we can switch over to the network. And now we've got Binance Smart Chain set up in our MetaMask, right? But more than that, we want to have it connected to our ledger. So how do we do that? Well, that's uh, the only trick to that is, is realizing that in order to uh, manage a Binance Smart Chain wallet within MetaMask, with a ledger, is you have to use the Ethereum app. I know it's weird. Right, because we over in Ledger Live, we use the Binance Smart Chain app to set up this account. So why now do we are we using uh, why are we using the Ethereum app? Well, it's just the way MetaMask works. You got to use the Ethereum app. So we need to get out, and we and and Ledger Live isn't going to help us because we're using MetaMask. So we have to be in the right network before we try to do this. Right. We have to manually go over to the correct app. All right, there's Ethereum. We'll get in there. And then we'll add. Oh, we'll connect a hardware wallet. We'll use our ledger. We'll hit continue. We'll pair it up. And there it goes. Now, notice these are Ethereum addresses, right? And Ethereum balances. Actually, I believe those are my BNB balances, but uh, MetaMask is thinking that they're ETH, right? So not everything is, like, seamless, right? But anyway, that's the one we want. We'll hit unlock. And now it says BNB, even though before it said ETH. That's, that's my BNB balance, right? Point 0.1. Uh, okay, that's all great. It sees my Alice. What about that Binance US dollar? Well, where's that? Right? There's 10 bucks of Binance US dollar in there. Well, we're going we're gonna to have to uh, manually add that. Right? So let's go over to uh, the Binance Explorer, Binance Smart Chain Explorer. Let's put in Binance US dollar. Right there, it is the Binance pegged US dollar. I need that contract address. We'll copy that into our clipboard. We'll go over here to MetaMask. We'll choose import token. We'll paste that in. Right, and then we'll hit add custom token. It already it sees it. It was there. It just wasn't listed in the tokens. And there it is. So now we've got those ten Binance US dollars. 
this is a much better way to manage Binance Smart Chain wallets, but there's a little bit of a learning curve, right? I got a lot of videos on how you do all this, right? Uh, I believe the the pancake swap video. back from 2021 it's i have a painstakingly detailed walkthrough of how you set up metamask with your ledger device actually in here i don't even use the ledger device i just use metamask and binance or binance smart chain so i probably should do an updated video on using the ledger device but anyway Paste that. Um, okay. Woo. Spirituality gave me $10. Oh, not $10. Uh, 10 euros. I don't think euros are as much as dollars anymore. <laughs> I'm not trying to bag on your currency, dude. <laughs> we should all be using uh, Bitcoin anyway, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Spirituality. Sorry about the difficult questions. Respect and gratitude. Okay, so let's see. Did anyone ask anything crazy tonight? Uh, Fenberio. If I added a BTC account on mobile Ledger, but it's not showing up in my laptop, thanks in advance. The mobile version of Ledger Live and the desktop version of Ledger Live are separate from each other. So if you added uh, an account uh, using the mobile version, you need to connect your ledger to Ledger Live and add it uh, manually into Ledger Live. So um, let's say. If you're in Ledger Live here, And I don't know, um, it's kind of a hard example, but um, you got to get, oh, you got to hit C all to this. So you hit plus, right? And you added the account. Come on now. Okay. Okay. You added an account using, uh, let's just say Bitcoin, right? Um, yeah, see, now my ledger device wants me to open the Bitcoin app. Notice I'm communicating with the, the app, um, with my ledger device through Bluetooth, even though it's connected to the computer, it can still communicate with the mobile device, right? I don't know what you what kind of account you tried to add, but I'm just kind of giving. Give but notice here that it's the same, pretty much the same process that I showed you earlier when I added, uh, when I attempted to add a Bitcoin account over on the desktop version, right? So I can add a new Bitcoin account here, drop some Bitcoin in it, but it won't show up on the desktop version of uh, Ledger Live until I manually add it over in Ledger Live. And it's going to take a bit here because I have so many Bitcoin accounts on this ledger. At, at some point, it's going to offer me a new account. All right, well, that's going on. I wonder, did spirituality ask me anything earlier that I missed? Perkster. I like that. Perkster. It's a good handle. Uh, 
Kay, Barbara Kay. Um. Oh, is it done yet? It's not quite done. Still not quite done. Um, so uh, Kojo asked, what do you think about the airdrop in the HODLer's wallet of ETH after the merge of ETH? I think if you've signed up for airdrops, um, I think they, they should be, it should be a seamless conversion. I, I'm not, you know, is most generally when you sign up for an airdrop, you've given them your Ethereum public address or your Bitcoin public address or whatever. Well, in uh, you're talking about the merge. So if it's an Ethereum address, it should still work after the merge, unless wherever you're getting the airdrop from is not compatible for some reason. But I would think that they would be, right? The, like we mentioned earlier, the guys doing the merge probably were aware of all these issues. So I think it should be a seamless transition. All right, let's do uh, this uh, 13, Bitcoin 13. We'll go ahead and add that. Uh, let's go, where's Bitcoin 13? Oh, did I add all those other ones too? Doggone it, irk. I didn't want to do that. Pfft, it added all those empty ones too. Anyone, uh, anyway, 13, right? Uh, so I want to receive, uh, <laughs> verify. Yeah, I'm not going to verify. I'm not going to worry about it. Yes, I'm sure. Jeez. Okay. All right, let's copy that address. Uh, actually, let's share it. Let's share it with myself here. All right. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is I want to want you to see... I would also like to change this from uh, Bitcoin 13 to Bitcoin new. Just so we can, so it stands out a little bit from all the other Bitcoin addresses. Uh, let's go over to, um, eh. I don't know. Let's let's do Coinbase. Uh, let's buy some Bitcoin. Let's buy fifty worth of Bitcoin. Um, what what was that? Oh, it's going to come out of my U.S. dollar wallet. I've got some money in Bitcoin, right? It's going to cost me two bucks, but I'll do it for you guys. We'll hit buy now, and I just bought some Bitcoin. Okay. Now, what I want to do is uh, grab that. A Bitcoin address. Boop. All right. Let's grab this. Bitcoin. This is a native SegWit Bitcoin address. It starts with BC1. Go over here. Uh, let's do a send uh, all the Bitcoin to that address. Hit continue. Oh, you guys couldn't even see my phone, could you? Could you? Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess you could see my phone. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to send it, right? Uh, XLS, right? Oh, I can't see it on here anymore. Okay, whatever. We'll just assume that I did all this correctly. Get out of the way. All right. Send now. Got to put in my two-factor. And for Coinbase. Confirm. Off it goes. Now, this might take a while, right? It might take a while for the Bitcoin to actually end up where I sent it. But where did we send it? Uh, not here. No, no, we didn't send it here. We didn't send it to Bitcoin main. 
we sent it to uh, this account. I gotta grab my phone here. Uh, we're gonna have to wait a couple of minutes for it to show up here. Right, but we okay. So what I'm trying to demo for you is I just added a new account onto my phone only. I did not add it into Ledger Live on my desktop, only on my phone. Now you can export your desktop accounts to your phone app, but you can't go the other way, right? There's no way to like shoot your phone accounts to your desktop. Right, you have to like. Come on, I want to see that Bitcoin come in here. It's not going to oblige me, is it? Anyway, we'll we'll wait for the Bitcoin to show up in this wallet if I did everything correctly. Um, so we talked about the merge. Uh, Barbara Case driving to Atlanta. Google Map showed you a BTC ATM. I did not go to see it myself, just thought it was interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Uh, funny how Google knew you were into BTC. <laughs> I went to, uh, we went to an Asian grocery store. My wife wanted some spices that you, you know, she's, uh, she bought an Indonesian cookbook. She's from Indonesia. So there's a lot of spices in those recipes that you can't get at uh, the normal stores. So we went to an Asian grocery store and they had a Bitcoin ATM. Um, I noticed that BTC was selling at a premium though. Uh, so if you use Bitcoin ATMs, you have to buy your Bitcoin at a premium if you're buying Bitcoin, right? And you can also cash out from those too, but you, you're selling at a, a, at a premium too you know you're getting less for your bitcoin when you use a bitcoin atm but theoretically if i had bitcoin in my wallet on my phone and i had access to it from my phone i could go to a bitcoin atm and cash out right the only thing is like modern bitcoin atms all most of them are going to require some form of kyc I think the one that I saw earlier today was asking for my phone number. Uh, but then they said something about um, you'll need your ID or passport for larger transfers. So I don't know what the limit would have been, but perhaps I could have like cashed out some of my Bitcoin um, with just my phone number. But that ties to me anyway. That, that ties to my identity. So it's not really anonymous. Boy, I wish this Bitcoin would show up here. I would really like to show you guys this thing. But it's, I don't think it's going to oblige me. Um, uh, let's see. Is that the same? Is that the address? It should be. Did I send out that Bitcoin yet or not? I thought I did. Okay, there. So we can confirm that address there. Okay, so look at it. We can confirm it is the same address. Right? Oh, it's different. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's there. Okay. Woo! Okay. All right. So uh, we can look at the receive transaction. And we can see there, down at the bottom, see it says uh, received. Oh, well, that's weird. Anyway, I guess it, the two field is my wallet address, right? It ends in 8XLS, right? That's where I sent it from Coinbase. All right, so uh, mission accomplished, right? We, we created a new account on our phone. We drop some Bitcoin in there, and now I'm like, well, it's not in Ledger Live. What do I do now? Well, uh, you take that same uh, device that you use to set up the phone-based Bitcoin account. You connect it to your computer, right? 
and then you do you have to do an add account. So we'll do add account. We'll add Bitcoin. It's going to take a bit. Uh, I can turn this off. It's going to search for any Bitcoin wallets that I've created on my device. Well, we just created a new one using the phone app a couple minutes ago. So it's in there somewhere, but I have to manually add it into my Ledger Live desktop like we're doing now, right? Connect the device, go to the add account, and then let it scan the device for any existing Bitcoin wallets, right? I know it's kind of weird that I have all these empty wallets, so it makes it adds a layer of complexity that I wish I didn't have to... <laughs> Didn't have to, I should probably migrate everything over to a brand new device or or maybe just use a new device during the live stream that doesn't have so many old empty Bitcoin wallets on it when I'm doing these demos. Maybe I'll get that set up next week so I don't have to go. I don't always add accounts either. Uh, but there should be a fairly new account. And how much is this in Bitcoin? Uh, 0 0.002. 0 0.002. Oh, there it is, right? Oh, it turned out to be Bitcoin 13 on this version too. Because it's the 13th Bitcoin account created on that wallet. Right? And so we can just rename it here. We'll just call this one new. All right. It's not quite done synchronizing yet. Okay. I don't need to add the new account. We'll hit add account. We'll hit done. And lo and behold, Bitcoin new is now uh, showing up in my desktop version of Ledger Live. I just had to manually add it by connecting the device to my computer. But it's there. All right. So it doesn't matter what kind of account you created, whether it was a Cardano account or an Ethereum account or you know, a Litecoin account that you created on your phone. If you have it over in your mobile version, you just need to connect the device to your computer and go to the add account and add it manually, whatever it is. You could do Litecoin, right? Whatever kind of account you have on the phone that you're not seeing in... Uh, Ledger Live, you know, you could say, oh, well, I added Solana on my mobile version. I don't see it. And I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, let's see. I was going to do uh, Cardano. I don't know if I want to get into all that right now. Okay, birds, bees, and trees. I hear something about an Ethereum upgrade or something lately. Do you know what it is? I'm out of the loop lately and missed your first hour. Maybe you covered it already. Yeah, we did talk about the Ethereum merge supposedly uh, is on schedule to occur on the 15th, which is an upgrade to the Ethereum network, which has been in the works for a couple of years now. Uh, it's supposed to go live on September 15th. Um, all things being equal, you shouldn't really need to be concerned about it. You don't need to do anything to your wallets, as far as I know. Um, everything that I've read about it says that it's kind of going to be happening under the hood, but that Ethereum will... It'll be a big thing because now Ethereum will be stakeable uh, natively, and so you'll there'll be a lot of opportunities to earn money on your existing Ethereum holdings, Right natively or on other platforms or whatever. But I would still, you're going to see a lot of services where people are offering to pay you interest on your Ethereum and they'll want you to deposit it in their platform. That way they can stake it and pay you, you know, part of it, right? They'll get their cut, right? The better way to do it is natively in your own wallet. Uh, notice, I noticed too that uh, on Coinbase, uh, Coinbase is now offering uh, 
loans. I, I don't know where. I thought it was here. I don't see it now. But I remember they were offering loans. There, there it is. Borrow cash, right? You can borrow cash uh, from Coinbase using your Bitcoin as collateral. This is the same business model of Celsius, right? The one that went bankrupt. Remember them, right? Now, now Coinbase is getting into the crypto lending sphere, and I would n personally, I would never do that. Never gonna borrow against my Bitcoin because you'll eventually, if you want your Bitcoin back, you'll have to repay the loan. Maybe you might be in a position where you've got a lot of Bitcoin and you need fast cash and, you know, you're going to get, you know, you'll know you, you'll get, you have a steady income. And so maybe you want to borrow against your Bitcoin and slowly pay it back over time. And once the loan's paid off, you'll be able, that'll free your Bitcoin up and you'll be able to put it back in your own wallet. But God knows what could happen, Right. It didn't work out so well for the Celsius depositors, right? They still don't have access to their Bitcoin, those that deposited Bitcoin. So I know Coinbase is the biggest one out there, but I'm still a little leery of doing, you know, crypto loans, using your crypto as collateral when you deposit it with a third party. Uh, hmm. If you need money, okay, I get it. Not really that great. I don't know. I, I guess uh, they're charging interest too. Uh -huh. I don't see a um, Bitcoin um, staking. I think, uh, I guess you can earn interest on some of your stuff. I think now that Coinbase is, is going to, will pay you interest on, Ethereum deposits. Yeah, so you can, they'll pay you interest on your Ethereum deposits. But that means you have to leave your Ethereum in their care. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. They'll, they'll, I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities to earn your Ethereum while it sits, earn interest on your Ethereum while it's sitting in your own wallet. If you lock it up in, you know, if you stake it natively. So we'll be looking forward to that in the future. Uh, I bought Magic Croft by swapping ETH on MetaMask. Can you stake it even though usually only stake Minecraft on MetaMask through BNB? Um, not that familiar with Magic Croft, but just off the top of my head, uh, if you can stake it, uh, it, whatever their native staking, let's see if we can find it here. Was it Magic Croft? What'd you say? Magic, Magic Craft. Okay. I don't see that. Oh, okay. There it is. Okay. Um, so it looks like it is, you know, you it is supported on Binance Smart Chain, Phantom, and Ethereum. So if from what you're saying, you can only stake it on Binance Smart Chain, you would probably need to convert it over to Binance Smart Chain format to stake it. Right? You have to go over here and... I've never used this before, so I wouldn't know for sure. Yeah. So you, I don't know. This looks fairly new. They may have some staking available on the Ethereum platform, but from what you've just mentioned, it's only stakeable on uh, Binance Smart Chain. So I think you would need to convert it back over to Binance Smart Chain. I'm not sure. I, I'm. We're almost done, so I don't really have whole lot of time to talk about it tonight but just the short answer is probably <laughs> osmosis yay i was going to buy some of that tonight but i got a little uh caught up in some other stuff i hope you guys learned something tonight uh good luck to everyone who's out there invested in cryptocurrency uh 
keep the faith and uh, remember the price goes up and down, but the, you know, the, the technology is emergent and it's probably going to be around for a while. Uh, it's a new form of money. And uh, just seems like everything's going digital in our world today. Seems to be the place to be. Anyway, uh, like I said, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Don't forget, I'll do this again next week, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please join me for the live stream from Michigan, where you can throw out questions, and I'll do my best to get them answered. Hope to see you there. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to subscribe to my channel, I would appreciate it. When you subscribe, there's a little bell that you can click that will allow you to be alerted whenever I post new content. Once again, thanks for joining me and hope to see you again. And thank you, Dan, and thank you, JDO, for uh, moderating the live stream tonight. Uh, always appreciated. And thank you, everyone that was here. And uh, if I didn't answer your question, please shoot me an email. I'll see you guys next week.